We've seen how increasing the surface contact between the bones of the joints helps the feet to function in the most efficient way possible. Today, we'll consider the knees. How do we increase the surface contact between the bones of the knee joint? The knee is made of the femur at the top and the tibia at the bottom. The femur has an internal and external condyle, which are these round protuberances at the back. The tibia also has what are called condyles, and they are like an indented plateau at the top of the tibia for the condyles of the femur to sit on. To get the most surface contact between the condyles of the femur and tibia, the knee needs to be extended and not bent. Many times I've come across advice that says, for good standing posture, you should slightly bend your knees so that you aren't extending your knees too much. Though there's a kernel of truth to this, it's generally bad advice. Most people bend their knees way too much and will habitually bend their knees when they're standing or walking. Perhaps the most significant problem at the knee for most people is that people are way too forward on their knees. We've looked at this a little bit before. You'll recall that the condyles of the knee are reinforced at the back. Having those joint surfaces in contact makes sense. The reinforcement there is so that the back of the knee can take more weight. But most people move the bottom of the femur forward on the tibia and take the weight off of the back of the knee. This is part of the overall postural problems that people have, where the pelvis tips forward at the front, the mid-torso spills forward out over the feet, and the upper leg becomes angled. The kernel of truth to the idea that people are straightening their legs too much is that many people are habitually pulling their lower leg back as well as out. Most people, if they are asked to straighten their knees, will pull their lower leg back quickly but this is not how we want to straighten the leg. We want to push the upper knee, which is the lower part of the femur, back and up. Consider that as a direction, pulling the lower part of the femur back and up. Try pushing back with your hand as an experiment, then try without the help of your hand. Bear in mind that you don't want to rotate your iliacs forward and down when you move your upper knee back, which means this adjustment should not cause you to poke your butt out. This probably won't be all that easy, as bringing the weight onto the backs of your knees will challenge your sense of equilibrium. You may feel like you're going to fall backwards, but over time, this direction can help you straighten your legs. Though we do want to straighten the knees in many situations, there are also times when we want to bend our knees. In the last episode of this series, I asked what bending the knees actually means, because when you're standing, you can't just bend the knee joint. You will also bend the ankle joint, or the hip joint, or all three joints. How do you think people habitually bend their knees? Maybe you experimented with this since last episode and you know. If you ask someone to bend their knees, it's likely that the first thing they will do is move the knee forward. That is done by bending at the knee and ankle joint, or by bending at the knee, ankle, and hip joint. The point being, this occurs when the ankle joint bends with the knee. I will go into why this is a problem in a future video. For now, let's simply ask, can you bend at the knees and hips only, and not bend the ankle joint? What that means is that when you bend your knees, your lower leg will not move in space. The tibia, the bone of the lower leg, will not go forward or back. In order to do this, you will have to move your hips backwards in space and your torso will lean forward. It should be clear that this gesture is counter to multiple common habitual problems. It will help us get our hips back. It will help get us off the front of the knee and onto the back of the knee. And it will help us get extension through the lower leg, even when bending the leg. One way to begin working with this is to stand in front of a chair. Make sure the backs of your legs are touching the chair. Then bend at your hips and your knees. This will bring your pelvis backwards to be over the chair. Check to see what has happened to your lower legs. Have they gone forward or back? Or have you managed to not move them? Since your legs were touching the chair when you started, it should be obvious. If you succeed, your lower leg will be straight and your upper leg will be rotated backwards. Your torso will lean forward. Don't go too deep into this bend to begin with and try to make sure you're not pulling your ribcage forward and down, which will be habitual for most people, so you have to take some care 
that you're not pulling down. This is bending the knee in the new way, bending at the knee and hip joints, but not at the ankle joint. This concept comes from Jando Masoero, though it's based on what FM Alexander called the position of mechanical advantage. In our day-to-day -day life, we can employ this gesture in many situations. Let's say you're doing the dishes, or washing something in the sink, or washing your hands. You're going to have to lower yourself into the sink. How do you habitually do that? Observe yourself. Most will find that they bend in a way that is obviously not desirable. They will collapse to one side, or push their pelvis forward against the sink, or poke their butt out and drop their ribcage down to lean on the counter. The strain on their body, and in particular on their back, will become obvious if they have to sustain the position for very long. But this is how we can actually change our posture, by changing our movements during day-to-day -day activities like this. If we consciously decide to bend at the hip and knee joints, and not the ankle joints, we can bring ourselves down to the sink in a way that is sensible and sustainable. This position of mechanical advantage, which is also called monkey by some Alexander Technique teachers because it looks somewhat like a movement a monkey would make, is something we will come back to repeatedly in the future. Refining this gesture is as important as refining standing, sitting, and walking, because it's something we should be using in our day-to-day -day life a lot. It's also the first stage of sitting into a chair or squatting down to the ground. We've looked at the feet, the ankles, and the knees, so now let's look at the upper leg. If we look at the top of the femur, we see this kind of protuberance at the outside of the leg called the greater trochanter. When you have these sort of irregularly shaped eminences on a bone, that's typically a sign that a number of fascia and muscles attach there. We often want to have clear directions for these protuberances because they can have a great effect on our fascia. So I want you to think over everything we've looked at so far in this series about the legs, and then I want you to tell me what kind of direction we should apply to the greater trochanter. Or, another way to think about this question is, what movement are people habitually making with their trochanter as part of their overall poor posture? And if you know that, then you should be able to figure out what kind of directions we could use to counter that habit. Give it some thought, and then join me next episode, and we'll finish off our understanding of the femur.